Welcome everyone to the uh, this nice talk that we are doing virtually here, broadcasting live from 329 East Main, the Cole Arts Center at uh, Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, I'm just going to make sure uh, somebody give me a thumbs up if they can if they are getting the audio good now. Yes. Okay. We're very happy to have you here with us. And we are happy to um, be able to do this artist talk. Uh, this is the first time that we've done one quite this way via Zoom. Uh, not being able to have a, a reception and a, a personal one-on-one -on -one with the artists, we thought this would be the next best thing to be able to walk around the exhibit with um, some of the artists that are presenting here right now. And we hope that, um, that you will want to come down in person and, and see the show uh, for yourself if you haven't already done that. Uh, but this will be an opportunity to hear from the artists a little bit about their own work. And we, uh, uh, the, the first artist that we're going to be hearing from tonight is uh, Sarah Fisher, and she will be um, uh, introducing her uh, collaborator uh, Rachel Anderson. Uh, Sarah Fisher is a multidisciplinary artist living and working in Houston, Texas, born and raised in the Midwest. She graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 1986. Art is Sarah's fourth act. She ran an award-winning one-woman marketing communications agency in the 1990s with her husband of 30 years. She has raised two children. In 2010, she co-founded and ran a nonprofit called Positive Works, created to get ahead of bullying in school communities in Houston. Sarah began painting in 2007 at age 42. She studied painting at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston's uh, Glassell School of Art and completed its block program in 2018. Since 2016, Sarah's work has been exhibited across Texas, including SFA's 2019 Texas National Juried Competition. She has, has um, had solo painting exhibitions at Pace Gallery and Front Gallery, both in Houston, and her upcoming solo painting exhibition at the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts in Lubbock opens on June 4th. Uh, please help me welcome uh, Sarah Fisher. We'll turn the time over to her. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in this afternoon. I wanna begin by thanking the SFA School of Art. And I wanna do this on behalf of myself and Karen Isley, who will be speaking about her beautiful exhibition following this talk. We also wanna thank the SFA Friends of the Visual Arts who you know, provided incredible support for our exhibition and the Cole Art Center. We also wanna give a special shout out and thank, thank you to John Handley, the former director of the SFA Galleries and the new executive director of the Museum of East Texas in Lufkin. John gave us our shows way back in July of 2019. And he took this new position in the fall. He was so kind to stay with us. And he has curated our shows and just hung with us through this whole process. And we also want to thank Whelan McMullen, an MFA student at SFA, and his incredible team installed our shows. He did an incredible job. Okay. Standing right here with you live to speak about our exhibition, Found Loaded, is in itself a show of resilience and an act of defiance. Making work about what I call the cost of belonging is an incredibly emotional experience. Sharing this work, even the first time with a single person, is really daunting because it's so personal. Sharing it in a, in a forum like this is exhilarating, but daunting. Finding the words to talk about it tonight is like a whole other level. But I'm here, I have my words, and I feel your support. And I'm going to do my best to take you through this exhibition, uh, Found Loaded, our, my exhibition with Rachel Anderson, who's going to join us in a few minutes from Lubbock, Texas.
So why is it so difficult to talk about this work? It's because this work has to do with trauma and trauma stains us in a way that steals our confidence and our sense of safety in this world. It literally locks away the words we need to explain ourselves to other people, even explain ourselves to ourselves. And that compounds our despair. So what is this exhibition about? Why have we titled it Found Loaded? Found refers to the found objects used throughout this body of work. Objects as seemingly unrelated as dry cleaning identification stickers, like these chain stickers, sacramental furniture, used grocery bags, newspapers, magazines, vintage wood carvings, and even old cross sticks. This is the word that struck me three years ago when I walked into my Houston dry cleaner and asked a very simple question. Could I please have a stain sticker? A simple question on a ubiquitous errand that ended up changing my creative practice. It altered the trajectory of my emerging art career and it really changed my life. And this kind of loaded um, situation, it, it, changed, it changed everything about what I'm doing as an artist. And it was the word that came to mind when that stain sticker was in my hand to the dry cleaner. I just thought stain, that is that's such a loaded word. And that, just the act of, of that was what I call a side swipe. It's a, it was a positive side swipe for me, going about my life and bam, suddenly I had this revelation and it, it, was, it was a good revelation and it, um, it just changed, it, cha it put me on a brand new path, a new creative path, very exciting. So the work in this exhibition explores the psychological after effects of life changed by, by these experiences. And I'm standing here next to one of, one of many self-portraits in this show. The portrait of a very pregnant me. I'm here, I'm pregnant with our second child about to give birth. And I was actually standing cradling the face of our firstborn. So as we stand here, I'd like to ask you to think about something. Think about the human groups that you were sorted into and constrained by even before you were born. Your gender, your ethnicity, your nationality, your family, and maybe even your religion. Next. Think about how that list of human groups expanded as, as a little kid, you went off to school and you started to develop your own interests, to develop your own interests. And perhaps there were people in your lives who introduced you to, to other areas of interest or perhaps even curated different um, interests for you. So your, the number of groups in your life began to expand. Now call to mind the groups you joined on your own as a young adult. You joined a college, a university, perhaps the military, a profession, a marriage, a partnership, um, a political movement or a political party. Now think about the human groups that you still long to join, but you don't know how you're gonna get in. Also think about the human groups that you would love to exit, but it's either impossible or you just don't know how to go about doing that. And then think about how you talk to yourself about that. Think about how you respond to those feelings in your own mind. So I'm interested in how membership in human groups, both assigned and chosen, mark us as individuals. I'm also interested how individuals mark groups of people. And I'm very interested in how we as human beings respond in our minds and out in the world to these situations and experiences.
Now I told you earlier about my positive side swipe with the stain sticker. And now I have another quick story for you. Just before Thanksgiving in 2019, I experienced a different kind of side swipe. A phone call out of the blue from a family member that sent me down into an emotional vortex that lasted for several painful weeks. It was a tearful tailspin that led me to the day after Christmas, I was doom scrolling, as we do, doom scrolling on my phone, very sad. And I came across, came across this podcast called On Being, hosted by a woman named Krista Tippett. And the title of the podcast was How Trauma Lodges in the Body. And it was a conversation between Krista and the famed trauma researcher, Bessel van der Kolk, K-O-L-K, if you want to look it up. This conversation just it changed the way I saw my experiences and it gave me a new vocabulary for speaking to myself, which was huge, really helpful. That revelation sent me to find a trauma therapist. That led to the practice, a new practice for me of mindfulness meditation, which I'm happy to report led to, you know, I felt like I was, I've been since then on a journey toward self-compassion, agency, and resilience. In one of my therapy sessions, I, I had this vision for a new self-portrait. You know, I was in the middle of preparing for the show. And I could see this image of myself, but I needed help taking it. So I handed the therapist my phone, and I, I just asked her to take this photo. I had my hand on the door and my hand out here. That image, um, led to this piece here, which I've titled in. It's created with oil paint, graphite, and thousands of dry cleaning identification stickers, mainly, well, actually all stain stickers that I've layered one on top of the other, thousands of them, reducing stain to the word in. I made this piece while I was contemplating an incredibly tough decision. Um, and that decision was <laughs> whether or not to remain in certain relationships. Really tough. Whether or not to remain in relationships with people who've caused me great pain over the years. And you ask, well, why is that so tough if you're in pain? It's incredibly difficult because human beings are hardwired to assimilate and we are hardwired to belong. It's baked in and it's primal. But here's the thing, if our desperation to belong supersedes our sense of self, then what I've learned, what I've come to believe is that it's, we need to give ourselves permission to think about that and to do something about it. We need not remain silent or compliant out of guilt or obligation. And it's guilt and obligation that I believe can lay the foundation for oppression, repression, and even abuse. And it is so important that we learn to find our voice and speak up for ourselves. Which leads me to the anchor of our exhibition, a piece we call, Rachel Anderson and I call The Coat. Rachel Anderson is a fashion designer, she is also assistant professor and program director for apparel design and manufacturing at Texas Tech University. She is my dear partner in creating this long distance labor of love. And as I said, what I really feel is the anchor of this exhibition. And while our nickname for this piece is The Coat, the title for this piece is You Can Write Your Own Autobiography. So now I'd like to see if Rachel can join us. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone. Thank you for coming. I want to echo Sarah's thank yous. The list is long and we're, we're very, very grateful. Uh, and of course, I want to thank Sarah uh, for without this collaboration, uh, you know, this wouldn't have been possible for me to be a part of this project. And even now, as I'm starting to talk after listening to Sarah speak, you know, I'm, my voice is a little cracky, I feel it. Um, 
because we both have so much tied into the piece. It, it means so much to us personally. So I'm going to start out by uh, talking a, a little bit briefly about how Sarah and I met and the process of the coat. And then overall, you know, my personal takeaways and themes of this amazing collaborative uh, piece with Sarah Fisher. So uh, the collaboration with Sarah and I began during my time as artist in residence at Charles Adams Studio Project in Lubbock, Texas. Shannon Cannings uh, is a professor of practice in the Texas Tech School of Art. And she was touring Sarah around the artist studios uh, as Sarah was in Lubbock uh, for her exhibition called 44 Artists from Texas uh, that was being held at a neighboring gallery at the Louise Hawkins Underwood Center for the Arts. And she and I, you know, became instant fans of each other's work uh, once she walked into the studio. Uh, for me, my infatuation with her work began uh, when I just saw her multimedia stickered pieces uh, simply on the cell phone. So it started with the stain piece. And I agreed, you know, the stain, that word stain had so much tied into it on what it meant. And, Immediately when I looked at this repetition of stickers, I uh, related to it in a lot of different ways. Um, so, you know, her pieces I felt were really haunting and mesmerizing, the patterns, the self-portraits. Uh, and as we were working together, we, we were uh, looking at uh, what the coat shape was gonna look like and, you know, how we were gonna translate the sticker patterns into a 3D piece. And uh, I saw her, a newer piece that she had done that I hadn't seen before uh, called The Cold Place. And it has a really, you know, a coat shape in it that I saw. And I, I actually saw a garment immediately. So I knew that, you know, this was the one. Um, Sarah fell in love with my dress twalls that were on the mannequins on dress forms. So twalls are kind of prototypes of dresses that I drape uh, in three dimensions, three dimensional form on the mannequin uh, with muslin, a prototype fabric. And so, uh, you know, thus our collaboration uh, began. So for the next several years, it actually took several years to work on this together. Uh, we worked between Houston and Lubbock. Uh, never once meeting in person. Uh, and to this date, we still have not because the pandemic has happened since then. Uh, and Sarah and I have been working on this for two years and we still haven't gotten to uh, meet each other. Uh, the final coat uh, shapes came to fruition from our initial renderings and then ex experimental draping on the mannequin of the form. I would send the measurements for the blocks for each pattern piece of the coat uh, and Sarah would sticker the textile panels uh, there in Houston and then mail me uh, to Lubbock, uh, these rolls of stickered panels. And, you know, you could not believe how much I look forward to these panels coming in the mail because it was literally like my own personal art pieces that I was getting. I wasn't sure sometimes what the words were going to be. Um, and so as I got these panels in the mail, it was a bit daunting, you know, daunting and the fact that someone was actually sending me their art and then I had to cut it and I had to sew it. And, you know, I did not want to make a mistake. You know, I wanted to, to not make that call where <laughs> the stickers had to be redone. So, and it was also cathartic, you know, the words that came in uh, meant so much to me. And, you know, for more than a year, they came in a new component uh, of the coat was designed and constructed. Uh, Sarah and I talked on length at the phone with our own sessions, therapy sessions, on the meanings and the parallels. We shared memories, uh, shaping her panels of words into this form. Uh, it held so much meaning and weight for me, the words such as stain, repair, love, and even the word no. The coat was created pre-pandemic and uh, Pre-pandemic, there were a lot of things going on personally in my life, and you know these words uh, were sparking memories, reflection, acceptance, and over the course of time, ultimately healing and forgiveness uh, to people and areas in my life that I really needed to work on. You know, being a fashion designer and academic, 
I really wanted to connect to a piece. You know, I had worked with uh, fashion, of course, and fashion shows and uh, fashion exhibitions. I've worked some with artists collaborating, but until Sarah, I really haven't connected on a personal level to a piece. So this is the first time. Uh, my inner workings as a human are so private that I would have never been able to be this brave in dealing with pain and trauma without this collaboration with, with Sarah. It's really changed my work forever. Her bravery inspired me in continually creating the work like an unstoppable force, even if it was uncomfortable. Um, you know, in the end, themes for me on the coat, you know, it was important for both of us in dealing with trauma that we love the idea of the coat looking out away from our respective lives. Uh, it was important for us that the, the concept of hope be evident, that to design it in a way that brings the viewer into the pain of the piece yet at the same time reveals the beauty and the healing that the coat represents. Uh, I've identified with the experiences and her themes uh, in my life in the human group uh, many groups throughout my lives, either trying to fit in, trying to be something I'm not, trying to be someone else's view of me, another group's view of me, or desperately just wanting to fit in, you know, to just feel a sense of belonging and acceptance, you know, so the words in Sarah's work brought all of this to the surface, my trauma and my need for belonging and my need for acceptance. So we all have experienced pain in our lives, you know, no one is exempt from that as well as the words and experiences that have labeled us. With this finished coat, you know, the words are put on the body like an armor of beauty and strength. And even though the meanings of the labels have now changed two years later, a lot, after a lot of reflection, work, healing, and forgiveness, the words now have been transformed into this work of art. You know, art that adorns and envelops the body and strength uh, beauty, majesty, and healing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It means a lot to have you here in voice. <laughs> <laughs> Next, I'd like to say a few words about a little card that you're going to find in two different locations in the gallery. It's a little card that simply says, I forgive you. I placed it here in front of this double face self-portrait, which I created out of oil paint, graphite, correction fluid, and thousands of dry cleaning stickers once again. This one mainly with the word repair, but also a little bit of stain. I created this piece last summer into fall while I was involved in the process of repairing myself, which has been a real winding road, an obsessive conversation between the inner critic in me and my evolving, more mindful self. I was working on this piece and I started at the top and I had my face here and I just, the more I got into it, and actually it was funny, it was the better I was feeling, the more I felt the way to be most honest with this piece was to add this second face. Because the truth is, even as I evolve in, in my efforts to be more mindful, I think I'm always going to be battling my inner critic and I'm going to have to constantly to remind myself to forgive myself in the process. Okay, so you're also going to find this card at the other side of the gallery. Here, adjacent, or adjacent to my mixed media, self, or mixed media portrait of Congressman John Lewis, who left this world on July 17, 2020. It's John Lewis who is directly responsible for my ability and my willingness to forgive. And it's this gentleman who's, he's the reason that I made this card. It's his commitment to nonviolent resistance and his forgiveness of the very people who physically and verbally attacked him. 
it's just it's so inspiring. He was trained in the philosophy and discipline of Gandhi by Reverend Jim Lawson. And what he was trained to do, and it's just amazing to me, was literally to look his attackers in the eye and to see them as innocent little babies. And those are his words. And to ask himself, who taught this human being who was once an innocent little child to hate? And it was this very visceral idea that gave me a way in to the idea of forgiveness. And I, it was the way in I'd been searching for for years. And it inspired me to act. So after his death, I got on my computer, I designed this card, I printed it, I signed it, I put it in an envelope, I addressed it and stamped it. But it was after watching his funeral, it was very moving, that I got in my car and I drove to the post office and I mailed it. This was a very big deal. This was my thing, putting behind me years of sadness and bitterness. And so in order to, in, in celebration of John Lewis, of his spirit and his life, I'm very proud to offer these cards for every visitor to this exhibition. You are welcome to take one with you. And I hope that it'll serve as a reminder that if I can do this at age 56, that there's hope for anyone to find a better way to be in this world. Thank you. And I'm happy to take your questions. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I failed to mention before that you could type questions into the chat section. Uh, that's really the only way that we have to do a two-way communication here in our unusual uh, way of, uh, of having an artist talk via Zoom here. Um, some people have typed some questions into the, the chat already because I, I left a message there inviting some questions. Some people were asking about the stickers themselves, um, and, and people have sort of been answering each other. Um, but, um, uh, you know, Sarah, maybe you can tell us a little bit. Uh, you mentioned before that you asked for a stain sticker, but I don't imagine that you just kept going back and asking for stain stickers. They probably would have tired. Uh, uh, of giving you stain stickers uh, in, in order to make this artwork. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, I'm happy to. So yes, I had the initial sticker in my hand and I remember vividly saying to Dawn, the woman who was working there, could I, where do you get these? And she said, online. And I said, well, would you mind if I had a few more? <laughs> she looked at me kind of funny. She said, sure. And said so she, she tore off a strip, which I still have. And um, I took my goods and I ran, almost ran to the car. And the minute I hit the seat, I started Googling dry cleaning, stain, sticker. I mean, I didn't even know what I was looking for. Um, and so then I, you know, I was excited to discover these beautiful golden yellow stickers with, um, you know, I, I love the sand serif, italicized word. Stain. I thought it was, it was such a bold, beautiful statement. And they were different than the stickers that my dry cleaner had. Um, so yeah, I ordered them online and they, they came a couple days later. They come in a box of a thousand on a roll. And so I've just developed a um, kind of a technique for taking them off the roll, you know. So that's, they, they're available online. And I guess I should add that it was funny. I bought so many that I started getting promotional emails from the dry cleaning company. They have to wonder who I am. And uh, I, there was a sale on these stickers. And so when I clicked the link, I realized there were all these other words. I had no idea that, that you know, it was the cornucopia of vocabulary in the dry cleaning world. Stain, not only stain, but delivery, box, repair, starch, no starch, fold. And I've, I've used a lot of those words in, in other pieces. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Sarah. Uh, there's been a lot of other comments, which I'm sure that you can get to read here in a little bit, just uh, expressing thanks uh, for your openness and for your willingness to share these personal stories 
uh, and, and I, I can see that they've meant a lot to people. Uh, one more question is, Sarah, is there a difference for you in constructing a painting versus in constructing a stained sticker piece? Oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, well, I guess just the use of text is in and of itself different. I have the, I have the word, when I start a sticker piece, I, ha I usually have a word in mind to get going. I, and it's, They've been self-portraits primarily. Um, no, I guess when I start a painting, I don't have a word in mind. I have a mood or an emotion usually that I want to communicate, particularly if it's a self-portrait. Um, but, but I don't have words in mind. But what I love about doing both is the sticker pieces are really like painting with words. I mean, I really think of it that way. So I think that kind of ties the work together. Uh, one more question is uh, about the piece that you're standing in front of there with the red hand, uh, how the words and uh, the stickers sort of trail away at the bottom. They were just wondering about your, your decision-making process there and, and why you might have done that. Hmm. Well, I... I really think I left it unfinished because these are such emotional pieces. And I think the process that I'm going through, that we all go through when we're, we're working through emotional situations, it's, it's unfinished. You know, so it just made sense to me. Gosh, when I look around, yeah, several of them are that way. Um, I think it's unfinished business. And so I thought it was fitting. And I, I you know, I just thought it made sense. I thought it made sense. I think that was something that I wanted to remind myself of. And I think it's important to, you know, this is not about perfection. This is about evolving and working, you know, just working on ourselves over time. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to our next artist. But before uh, we do that, I just wanted to say that, uh, Sarah has invited you to come down and to take some of her artwork with you. Uh, we do hope that um, if you haven't come to see the exhibition already, that you would be very interested in coming down to the Cole Art Center. The Cole Art Center is open and uh, it's normal hours uh, are, are as they have always been. Uh, that's Tuesday to Friday from 12.30 to five and Saturday from 10 to five. So um, please do come down and see these great exhibitions. And um, uh, we've walked around virtually with the artist. Please come and, and, and see it in person. Um, Karen Isley uh, is our, our next artist and they're making their way to the upstairs gallery right now where uh, her work is on display. Uh, Karen Isley's current paintings look at the way images in today's fashion media borrow from historical references, especially in the realm of religious iconography. Her work incorporates the ancient medium, medium of egg tempera and the use of clay, boil, uh, clay bowl and 24 karat uh, gold leaf. Karen has a business degree from Texas A&M University and a Master of Architecture from Texas Tech University. She received her certificate from the MFA H. Glassell School of Art in 2019 and has studied traditional Byzantine iconography since 2004. Karen's work has been shown in multiple venues, including the Lawndale Art Center's Big Show and Lending Library our own Texas National, the Third Coast National, and most recently, the Assistant League celebrates Texas Art in Houston and the new Texas Talent Exhibition at Craighead Green Gallery in Dallas, Texas. Karen was selected to attend the Helmsen Residency in Sp Spaltz Videl, Germany, where her work was shown at the Monks Kirk Gallery she currently lives and works in Houston, Texas. 
And so uh, I will turn the time over to her. So um, uh, we're gonna look at a few of her slides first. So I will share that screen now and uh, she can start talking about, um, about her work. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for that introduction, and thank you for everybody who's joining us tonight. We wish you were here in the gallery, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> um, can I see the slides? Or... So this first slide that I wanted to share with you um, are two of my traditional icons. The one on the left is done in the Russian style, and the one on the right is um, the Greek method. This all started in 2004, when a good friend invited me to an icon workshop. I didn't know anything about icons, um, but the church that I go to doesn't use icons in their service, but I love painting and um, learning, learning new things and hanging out with this friend. So I have to say, um, this workshop changed everything for me. I really fell in love with this ancient process of using all these natural materials. And um, the more I learned about the imagery and symbolism in icons, um, the more I was drawn in. So on the second slide, at the same time I was learning about iconography, I was playing with oil paint in my studio. I, again, love process. So I was pouring the oil and manipulating the surface to try to find new shapes and forms and textures. The painting on the right, I mean on the left, is uh, referring to chandeliers. I have a chandelier series. And the one on the right is just about landscapes. So I felt like these were two very different things I was doing, polar apart, but that that was fine. And then the next slide. In 2014, I had the idea of using some of the icon imagery to inform these abstracted landscapes. So I used the trees, water, lines, and mountains, for example, to give structure. And then next slide, please. And then a couple of years ago, I saw this photo in a Vogue magazine, the photo in the middle. It was an advertisement for a purse. And I was immediately struck how much it looked like the holy family icon. And I thought, what would happen if I use all these materials and processes that I had learned and painted this as though it was an icon? So that's how this series started that's in the gallery today. So the next slide, please. Wanted to tell you a little bit about the materials that I use. My paint is made with egg yolk and white wine. The pigment is ground up um, rocks, precious, semi-precious stones, such as malachite and lapis. And those are some of my tiny little brushes there. The right side of the screen um, is about a method that I learned to put down the gold leaf. I use a mixture called bowl, which is red clay, rabbit skin glue, water and a drop of honey. You put down the bowl where you want the gold to be, burnish it and sand it until it's as shiny and smooth as you can get it because the 24 karat gold is so thin that it shows everything that's underneath it. And then for the fun part, you get up really close to it, your lips are almost touching the painting and you breathe on it. The moisture and heat from your breath activates the glue, opens the pores of the clay, and this loose leaf gold will adhere. So on the next slide, these are just some process photos. Um, you have to begin with a firm support because of the egg tempera, anything that will, will um, crack the egg over time. And you also need absorbent gesso. So the gesso that I use is made of chalk dust, marble dust, the rabbit skin glue again, and water. Um, traditionally, 33 layers were used on an icon to represent Christ's life. 
And then the next three paintings are just part of the process, putting down the layers and the floats to the end of the piece. So both the Russian and the Greek style, I do at least five to six layers. And for reference, um, a 12 by nine, if I don't make my board, if I purchase it, <laughs> takes at least. So to go through the gallery and show you some of the paintings, You ready? So this piece I call work from home. I was immediately attracted to the mother and child composition. I will point out that the background here is done with metallic gold leaf, which is in some of the paintings in the gallery. And I like the textural, um, I like this texture. Um, I was attracted also to her clothing, the dress, the color red. And then I learned later that um, Valentino is the designer, and I know that he uses a lot of religious references in his work. So, the painting I call Peacock and the Dragon. Again, looking through Vogue magazine, I saw this model in this gorgeous blue dress with gold accents riding a stuffed peacock. And I immediately thought of the George and the Dragon icon, which is also in the gallery, her into that scene. I know no one will confuse this with a traditional icon, but I really broke, broke the border because I wanted to make it clear <laughs> that I did not consider this a traditional icon. And it's also a good time to point out that these contemporary pieces I do not want anybody to have a halo because they're not religious uh, pieces. So I'm always looking for an interesting place to put the gold and here the gold as well. Uh, I think we just experienced a technical difficulty. If you give us just a minute, um, oh, sure. we should be back online. I'm back, okay. So this is the Panda Crater painting, with the first painting I did. The Greek method has the background all in gold. Colors are because the highlights are just one on top of the other. It's important to point out that in shadow um, that we normally think of, the light always comes from within. And so the highlights are done in towards the body and then up towards the face. And speaking of the face, I don't, um, I'm not saying that this is what Christ looked like. The stylization is symbolic. The eyes are large because you're looking towards God. You see the ears because you're listening for God. The mouth is small because you're listening. And um, when you you're cautious with your words. One more thing about Christ, half of his head is written. And the other, are we okay? <laughs> um, to show that the man at the same time. And then his hand is saying his name. The top of the painting, I see XC, is shown the formation of his fingers. And I was also taught by a friend um, who said at that time, a teacher, when they had something important to say, would do like that saying listen to me this is important so on down the wall is the piece i showed you in the video in the slide i call it which is fire beware in the russian style this is the background can be gold to be usually the gold and i'd like to point out that the gold is representative of a spiritual doorway kind of that place between the spiritual and the material, the seen and the unseen, which is of the method. So these highlights, again, the light is, the highlights are one on top of the other, but there's a float in between, which is uh, almost like an oil glaze. And again, trying to think of gold, I did an 18 karat gold ink on the um, track. 
or over on this wall is a piece I call I'd like to point out that the background here is done with a different method of gold application using patent gold. And patent gold is adhered to a thin piece of paper and will only come off if you use and the gold side of patent gold will adhere. So this piece, when I saw her, I was definitely attracted to this angel wing to the side and then the placement of her hand. Gabriel is another traditional gallery that he name hand placement. Next to her is um, a painting that reminded me of that Panic Crater icon. The way he holds is like Christ holding the gospel. And then he had this crazy little skull keychain coming out of his pocket, so I rendered that in the gold. Which is this piece right here. Our Lady of Perpetual Help, I just pointed out quickly, if you happen to be able to come to the gallery, the background is done with the patent gold and the halos are done with the clay and gold, the loose leaf gold. And it's just interesting to me, the different uh, foundation, how it affects how the gold reads. This is a piece I call what? Um, I was definitely attracted by these three women, and it was a Jimmy Choo advertisement, and they had gold shoes, so of course I zoned in on the gold shoes. Let's see, I have a photo of the Trinity. The women were all wearing black, um, but I went ahead and changed their clothes to be more representative of the Trinity. Several people tell me that they look like the same woman, um, just three times, and it, I think that's because of the stylization of the face. And I like that fact because in the Trinity icon, the angels, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have that similar, similar look also. Next to that is 2020. This piece uh, was done in the spring, early summer. And I originally called it If 2020 Was an Apple. But the more I considered it, I loved her emotion, the movement. And then I realized the apple is representative of the Garden of Eden and the sword um, revelation. So it kind of encapsulated scripture for me. Then we have the Good Shepherd and its contemporary companion piece next to it. This little guy is the closest I've come to a halo. I rendered his hair in the gold. And you would be surprised how many photo shoots include lambs. The models either put them around their neck, like the Good Shepherd, or hold them in their arms. A friend who was here uh, visiting the show made an interesting observation. She said his clothing reminded her of um, Joseph's multicolored coat, also from scripture which I thought was really neat. And on the third wall, I call this piece Archangels. It was a model with this crazy wing headdress. I believe it was one model reflected. But as soon as I saw it, I thought of the Archangel. At the end of this row, there's another painting where I took the feathers and I put it all the way around the face. Um, to create the seraphim angel. This painting is called In Repose. It was a fashion shoot where the model was leaning against a couch, her upper body. Her arms were um, outstretched on a cream bolster, and her feet were on the floor. The photograph was from above, which definitely I felt was an intended crucifix. I tried to put her on a rectangular 
um, surface or a square surface and it just never worked. And when I finally put this image on the cross, it really came together for me. Next to her is a piece called Yummy Mummy. This is a Marnie ad that reminded me of the Our Lady of Perpetual Help icons that are in the gallery, but also this one, which is the Hodegitria, which is Mary presenting Christ to the world. Very different than the mother and child icon that I'll show you in a minute. And then quickly, this is the seraphim where the archangels were changed. On the fourth wall, <laughs> this little piece is the contemporary mother and child. And its companion piece that I showed you on the first slide is a few paintings away. This is a newer piece. Um, I was really attracted to this beautiful gold fabric behind the model. So I tried a new technique for me, putting the clay where I wanted the gold to be in this pattern, putting the gold down and then filling in the negative space with the clay. Lastly on this wall is a painting I call Snack. In the pedestal, is this painting, which is a Gucci ad. Of course, I was attracted to the outfit, the red, the blue, and the lamb. It didn't look contemporary to me at all until I got really close and saw her rings, which are chunky silver rings that say the word amour. There was a little bit of detail in the ad, but not much, so I left it out of my painting because it was a little confusing. But I was curious what it was about. So I investigated it and I found that she was actually standing on an ark that they had built surrounded by animals. And I was so happy <laughs> because sometimes I think it's just my active, overactive imagination with these compositions, but when it's definitely a religious reference, um, I like that. So in that same photo shoot was this piece, which definitely references um, the Garden of Eden. So I did the snake and the apple and the gold leaf. And then lastly, um, in the pedestal, are four pieces that represent some of the themes in the show. There's the Good Shepherd. The Christ figure. the mother and child, and the Mary figure. But I also tend to find um, the Trinity, angels, there are a lot of angels in advertising, and some themes such as the George and the Dragon, the 2020, or the Snap. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karen. Um, we had a couple of questions about um, the icons in general and um, people being familiar with icons or their functions. Um, I know that's probably, um, I, I would invite them to maybe take one of our art history classes, but uh, <laughs> it, if you could uh, give maybe a short answer on the purpose or the function of icons and then also be thinking about uh, another question. How forgiving is this process? Is it possible to fix mistakes? Uh, okay. Um, to the first question, the purpose of icons um, that I was taught and that speaks to me is that they kind of make the unseen seen. So it's a visual scripture. And one thing about the tradition Traditional, you might notice some of the pieces, um, the compositions you've seen before. And that's because these images are passed down through the centuries. I would never 
create my own traditional icon because I would never want to mislead someone about scripture. So it's very an honored tradition to, to use these same images. And then the other question was the process. Yes, you can fix mistakes, <laughs> fortunately. Um, the egg timber is pretty forgiving, but you, you definitely have to be careful as you mix your paint because the egg can become very waxy. So there's a process of knowing when the mixture of the um, egg and wine and maybe adding some water and pigment will make it strong enough so that it doesn't blow away, but um, not too strong because once the wax gets down, it's almost impossible to put another layer on. So I have um, sanded off several, <laughs> usually the faces. I've sanded off and started over. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, th again, there's a lot of, uh, of praise uh, and thanks for, thank for both artists here uh, in the comments. And um, uh, someone asks, is there a place to view both shows online? Um, I, I think not yet, but um, uh, we, we can, uh, we, we are putting together exhibition catalogs and videos, uh, and videos uh, which the, the videos will be available online and the, uh, these artist talks will also be available for viewing later. And um, the exhibition catalogs um, are, as I said, are, are in production. And so if you wanted to see these uh, exhibitions um, in, in a format other than the original, that would probably be the best way to do it. And so those are great uh, questions and we appreciate our audience participation here uh, this evening. We're happy to be able to do this. As I said, again, um, uh, the best way to see the work is to come down to the gallery if you're able to do that. And uh, again, those gallery hours are Tuesday through Friday from 12.30 uh, to 5.30 p.m. and Saturdays from 10 to 5. Uh, we thank our artists. We thank um, Michael Tubbs for uh, running the, he, he set all this up, this Zoom video live uh, multi-user. Uh, nobody could have done that here but him. So we are very, very grateful for that. We're grateful to um, uh, Wieland McMullen and the other graduate students uh, that we have uh, as gallery preparators and uh, our student uh, workers also who man the gallery uh, day to day. And we're grateful to be able to continue showing great art here in Nacogdoches. And we hope that, uh, that you can enjoy this show and, and the next shows to come. So, um, with that, uh, we will end our talk and uh, thank you all for coming.